evening and welcome to another edition of the Business Perspective for January 12, 2012. I'm your host, Jose Alpuche. Tonight we will continue our series on public finances. And for this, we have two very special guests to share their perspective. Before going to our first break, we would like to thank our sponsors, Brothers Habit Limited, Pandora's Window Box Nursery, The Angelus Press, Idea Lab Studios, and of course, the BCCI Western Union the only network that has been awarded the five-star quality service award by Western Union. Thank you, and we now go to our first break. Welcome back. Our guests this evening are, on my right, Mr. Edmund Zuniga, a recently retired public officer who had a distinguished career and rose through the ranks to become Auditor General of the Government of Belize. Also joining us is Dr. Philip Castillo, who is an assistant professor of the Faculty of Management and Social Sciences at the University of Belize in Balmopan, where he lectures advanced courses in, in managerial economics, research methodology, and public finance. He has his doctorate in development studies from the UWI. Dr. Castillo has previously worked as an economist at the Ministry of Finance in Balmopan as an and also as an information officer in the Government Information Service. Gentlemen, welcome, and good night. Good night, thanks. Thank you. Tonight we want to continue our discussion on public finances. Last week we had the Financial Secretary and Senator Hulse discussing, in broad context, the macro view on, on government finances. Um, several very important points were raised. Um, the fact that the government budget has just about doubled over the last 10 years, um, the fact that uh, we have a looming debt crisis on our hands, um, and the view uh, that we might not be doing enough to prepare ourselves for the looming uh, debt crisis. I believe that in this, we need to look at two issues that, that came out. Uh, one was uh, government expenditure, proper um, appropriation, and proper utilization of, of limited resources, but also to the issue of raising the, well, growing the economy to raise the, the, the tax base and the support base for the economy. Gentlemen, I want to uh, throw that open to you under the under the rubric of uh, of are we uh, living above our means as a as a country, um, Dr. Castillo? Probably we could start with, with your opening comments. All right. Good night. Um, thanks for inviting me. Based on the question, are we living above our means? Um, the short answer is yes. We are living above our means. But I would argue that that in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if we are importing quite a lot but then we're importing things that could subsequently grow the economy. I do not necessarily see that as a bad thing. So yes, we are living above our means because we are perennially having a budget deficit and we perennially import more than we export. But I'm saying that in and of itself, that may not be a bad thing if the things that we're importing are raw materials that form the basis of future and subsequent growth. So basically, bolstering production here uh, both for domestic consumption and uh, hopefully turning the um, the export uh, deficit into into an export plus. Yes, for example, um, if I could use the analogy of say um, a person who just left school and is now unemployed, and that person decides to let's say he or she wants to be a taxi man. If he's unemployed, his or her income is zero. Now to be a taxi man, you need to own a taxi, so you need to borrow money from the bank. And then now, when you means that you're living above your means then because you've borrowed funds. But if you borrowed money and then you're a diligent taxi man, you wake up early, you do your task, and you save, and you're a diligent taxi man. What that means is that you're investing in yourself. You, um, if that continues, if that trend continues, you pay off your taxi, the loans, you have your taxi, and you could expand and continue your business. So you could look at that from a national perspective. There's nothing wrong in borrowing money 
if the borrowed funds are invested wisely and productively. That would be my argument. The, do the numbers show the growth to match the, the borrowing portfolio? Well, obviously, no. If you look at what has happened over the past couple of years, um, if you look at Belize's debt trajectory, um, the countries we know owe close to two billion uh, with a B um, figure. Um, Ten years ago, say fifteen years ago, it wasn't like that. Um, so the debt has grown exponentially and substantially, and the revenues, in my opinion, weren't invested productively, and that's why we are in this dilemma that you mentioned earlier. Thank you. Mr. Zuniga, that raises your, the, the last point that Dr. Castillo raised, not invested properly and, and used diligently, I think, were, were his words. Now, you <coughs> have been at the forefront of this, basically looking at, at, at public expenditure and pronouncing on, on public expenditure, pointing out uh, where there's good practice, but also to where there, we have deviation from, from policy. What, what's your opening remarks? Yeah, I... I well, the topic, are we living above our means? I have to, I have to uh, say yes, it appears that we are indeed, based on the numbers that I came across while I was uh, employed as Auditor General. Um, as you would be aware, I served in that office for six years. And we, at the time, well, we produced annual reports as well as special reports, and I can safely say that all of those reports have uh, indicate shortfalls in revenues and indicate excess expenditures. And I, I, in terms of excess expenditures, that can only happen if there is a lack of planning, number one, or uh, careless spending. Um, in the case of shortfalls of revenue, more than likely the, the, the reasons are because there isn't sufficient care to ensure that uh, projected revenues are, are collected by the government. Hmm. The whole evasion, evasion of tax, etc. Well, that, 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 and the that certainly plays a role. I, I think uh, the, the bigger part of that to me is that there is not enough care to ensure that we collect what is out there, what has been assessed, uh, uh, the issue of income taxes. Enforcement. Yes. Mm. So you, you see that as a, as a major issue. Yes. Yes. I, I must say uh, at, the, at the chamber level, we, we do share that, that view that uh, there is a need to to broaden the base simply by enforcement, because we have a feel that that you that you do have, do have certain segments of the economy there that are not carrying their fair fair share. That's correct. So you believe from your work that you've done in the past that that points you in that direction. Yes, yes. Certainly, certainly the funds are there. The assessments have been made, but uh, we feel we feel to go after the money and collect. Dr. Castillo, as you relate to the growth of the, of the economy, um, I think when you look at the, at the sectors, we see, um, except for, for the new entrant um, oil, um, things have remained fairly, fairly stable. I mean, we've had declines in some of the subsectors like uh, aquaculture, for example, but others have remained more or less stable and shown some growth. But when you look at the numbers, oil seems to have done, uh, quite frankly, uh, an excellent job of being a, a, a prop. Uh, but there are doubts on that. How, how do you see things uh, progressing? Well, I certainly agree with you that um, we have oil and um, the, our earnings from oil in the past years have grown substantially. And that has sort of boiled the economy. But then oil is a finite resource, so we need to put our eggs in some other basket. Um, I would argue that, for the most part, um, let's focus on what I would consider our core competencies. Um, Belize is an agricultural country, and I think we ought to earn more from agriculture. And let me tell you how I think that can be done. 
um, focus on what in my thesis I regarded as a commodity chain. Um, Belize grows sugar, citrus, bananas. Um, Belizean bananas um, in Belmopan and in Belize City, you buy eight bananas for I think one dollar. Good. Now th those same bananas are exported abroad. Now those eight bananas say in the UK, um, they're sold by the kilogram, right? Um, those eight bananas could cost anything in the region of say five or six Belizean dollars. No, of that five or six Belizean dollars, how much does Belize get? How much does the Belizean farmer get? So what we need to do then, we need to move upstream, where if you focus on what I call a commodity chain, this chain links production in Belize and export and final marketing in a developed country. For the most part, our earnings are limited and we stay poor because we stay at the lower end. So we need to move up the chain. Um, I could use the example of what's topical now with Rosewood in Toledo District. Um, the person seemed to be cutting Rosewood as fast as they could um, like find it, and then it's exporting. The person cuts the Rosewood, um, he gets a certain amount, a very small amount. That Rosewood goes abroad and makes tables, beds, chairs, etc., where the value is substantially more. Now, somebody now needs to plan, could be the government, could be Bell Trade or some agency. How could Belize make more from its existing exports? And I think that that is how we value have addition. to value Yes. How we have to value add it in a sustainable and consistent way. That is how we have to think because we can't depend on oil, it's finite. We can't depend on fisheries, those resources are finite. So we need to look at things that could carry us over the long term in a sustainable way. And I think that for us to do that, we need to look again at our existing exports and see how much more we could make from them. And we can do that if we focus on value added. And how about some of the new areas, um, the services sector, for example? Um, we get the, or at least from the outside, I, I get the impression that there still is some mismatch between the education system and the direction that our, our economy should go? Well, yes, and um, you can't ignore the service sector, you need to focus on that. But the mismatch that you spoke about, I think there must be around 56,000 primary school students in Belize. But then there, uh, there are only about 16 or so thousand secondary school spaces. So the, for the vast majority of the Belizean population, their highest level of education is primary. No, those who end at the primary school, and they are, the va they are by far the vast majority, they still need jobs. So for the most part, you could target those in agriculture. And yes, you encourage those to go on for high school because you need this. A person in services require possibly a high level of education. Um, but my argument is that our education system as is now, most Belizeans end at primary school. For those who end at primary school, they still need jobs, and that's where you focus your agriculture. You can't ignore the services, and then the services will target those who continue on to secondary and even tertiary education. And then there are some other things, the financial sector, the other things that we need to grow. That, that's an alarming um, um, statistic that, quite frankly, I have not really uh, paid much attention to it. But basically what you're saying, that only a quarter of our our population, well, the, the, the school, primary school population actually proceeds to, to, to yes, secondary it's school. Yes, it's about that. It's about that. Yeah, and beyond that, that, the number numbers get even well, smaller. It becomes a pyramid. The yeah. base is, the, in fact, you could argue that there are substantial numbers of Belizeans who do not even enter the primary school system. Um, there is a law that says if you're 5 to 14, I think. You have to be in school. You have to be in school. Um, you go to any market town. Um, Anywhere in this country, you see children who are that age who are not in school. So there are some Belizeans who are of primary school age who are not in school. Then for those who do enter school, for most of them, primary, if they finish primary, that's the highest level they'll ever go. But you still, as an economy, as a country, as a society, you still need to cater to those persons. So my point then is that if you focus on agriculture, um, these persons have skills, or they could be taught skills. Uh, agriculture is such, at least the, um, some elements of agriculture are such that skills could be easily taught at some right, level. Right. 
uh, and so you want to encourage that. Um, but it needs national planning. It needs planning at a national level because the aim of seeking markets have to be done by a super national figure, maybe government, uh, bell trade, or even chamber of commerce or some agency. The small banana farmer may not do that. The, small, the person cutting rows within Punta Gorda may not do that. Somebody needs to do that and show him or her the possibilities. That's uh, uh, an interesting uh, point that uh, we will need to go to a break in a short while, but the point of national planning um, that he raised is one that we, we will want to address from your perspective when we come back. Okay. We must now go to a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let me remind viewers to please join us in this discussion. Uh, you can continue the discussion by sharing your thoughts on the topic uh, via email at businessperspective at belize.org or you can post a comment on the Chamber's Facebook page or better yet for our members you can use the virtual meeting place that is part of the Chamber's website portal. The address is www.belize.org forward slash VMP. Gentlemen, we left on the point of planning, the need for, for planning. And that raises a, a, a number of, of questions. The statistic that you gave uh, um, Dr. Castillo was quite alarming. Basically, 75% of our, our primary school um, kids don't make it into, into high school. Um, and if we say that the, the basis of growth would have to be um, an educated population, it raises a number of questions. Um, Mr. Zuniga, I recall many years ago we've, we've heard about government moving towards uh, program budgeting, specifically to address some of the planning aspects. Uh, what we have, uh, or what we have seen over the years is basically just almost a rollover but always a rollover of the budget with plus, plus, plus. Yeah. So we've gone from four change, 400 and, and something million 10 years ago to, to close to 900 million uh, now in terms of the, of the government budget. But yet, as uh, uh, Dr. Castillo alluded to, both as it relates to education, but the, the planning for industry, we are not um, doing what is required in terms of matching budget um, expenditure, uh, budget allocation, and matching our resources what, with, with what would be our, our projected um, uh, growth. Um, could you comment on, on the concept of, of, um, of program budgeting versus the current uh, system we have in place, and maybe offer some, some opinions on why we've not been able to, to adopt this? Well, the, the current system is, as you, as you rightly said, is more of a line item budget. And, and with incremental increases every year to, to meet the increased cost of services and so on. I, I know, in fact, when I went to the Ministry of Finance in 1997, that the plan then was to introduce program budgeting. I, um, there have been several studies and several consultancies to get it implemented. However, it it seems that it has fallen down. In fact, last year, I recall, it, it was again on the table to, to uh, have some pilot budgets presented in the program budget format. I am not certain where that is at this point in time. But if indeed we had implemented, or if we were to implement program budgeting, it would have to follow uh, laid down plans. In I know the Ministry of Economic Development, for instance, was leading on the 20, Horizon 2030. 30. Um, I am not certain where that is at this point in time, um, but that would have given uh, ministries an idea or, or confirmed to ministries where it is that they want to go and then they could develop their own strategic plans based on Horizon 2030, so that when we reach 2030, everybody would have met a particular goal or target. Um, but from an audit perspective, if we were to do pro program budgeting, it would make auditing 
for instance, value for money auditing right. much easier. And, and so people can see whether or not we are accomplishing what it is that the government says we are, we are going to accomplish in a particular time or from a particular program. Interesting. What's your view on that? Uh well, I want to make a clarification um, that you mentioned earlier. Um, you mentioned um, we, the, the figures, the abstract of statistics, um, SIB, said that we have around 69, um, 64, I think, 64,000 students or pupils in primary school, and we only have around 16,000 in high school. But you really can't look at um, that makes it about a quarter. But that doesn't mean that what education cost, the transition rate is only 25%. It could be more than that because some students are repeaters. And they, um, I don't want to go delve too much into education. This is not an education program. But generally, there are more students who leave primary school to go to high school. So even though there are 69,000 students in primary school and only 16,000 in high school, you, you really can't make a um, 16 over 69 and say that that's the amount that go to high school. It's not that. It's more than that. Mm. Um, but back to the point um, Edmund was saying about um, program budgeting and um, Horizon 2030. Right. Um, I think it all ties in because certainly given the amount of Belizeans who do not go to primary school, given the amount of Belizeans who finish primary school and do not go on to high school, you certainly need to plan um, because their skill level is such that I would think possibly agriculture, they could work in agriculture, or something that's easily trainable, they could easily train, because at the primary school level, the skill set that they live with isn't really much to, um, to speak about. Um, it's only now that I think that um, they're having computer classes at the primary level. Um, I'm certain that there's some schools in the country that do not have access to internet and computers, etc. So there certainly is a need for planning. Plan what would happen, how would they thousands of Belizeans who do not finish primary school, the thousands of Belizeans who are not even enrolled in primary school, how would they contribute positively and productively to Belize? And that's where planning like Horizon 2030, mm -hmm. etc., comes in. And, and improving uh, educational performance. Because le, le, let me be um, having a bit of a background or working a bit in the, in the agriculture sector. Um, Yes, the numbers are, are, are high as it relates to um, manual labor, yeah. but quite frankly, most of the more successful or, or, uh, industries right now are those that are mechanizing. So even in that sector, we would not have the, the full potential to take on um, um, that, those numbers. Uh, you ha yes, in, in, in cane, in citrus, in bananas, the numbers are, are high. But when you look at grains, for example, and the, the other agriculture areas, most of it is now uh, mechanized. And the ones that will be successful in the future will be, will be uh, mechanized farming, um, even for, for sugar. Uh, the only way we can, we can advance is if we do go away from manual cutting into, into mechanical harvesting as, as one, w one way of of improving the, the bottom line. And I think it raises the, the, the very fundamental question as to the, the nature of the education system and, and, again, what we are investing there and what we're getting in, in return. Um, Mr. Zuniga, as it relates to, to, to looking forward, um, what can be done? Uh, what, what in, from your perspective, could be done uh, to encourage a, a move towards more uh, medium and, and, and long-term planning? Well, we've, we've made several recommendations in the different reports that the, the Office of the Auditor General produced. Um, so far, in, in, in my time, None of the recommendations have been adopted. Recommendations like what? Like um, you, you will know that all the reports of the Auditor General go to the National Assembly. Right. The National Assembly really should refer those reports to a House committee, which is 
known as the Public Accounts Committee. Right. The Public Accounts Committee's function is to review those reports, look at the failings, and bring to task those accounting officers who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, issues such as failure to collect revenues, excess expenditures, losses, uh, those accounting officers should be questioned by members of the Public Accounts Committee who are members of the National Assembly, right. of actually members of the House of Representatives. Um, I, I believe if that were to happen, there would be some change, there would be some improvement to accountability. And if you can, if you can do that, then there would be more care and caution exercised in terms of ensuring that revenues are collected, in terms of ensuring that expenditures are kept to what the budget says the expenditure ought to be. So basically, but I mean, and these are my words, but to summarize what, what you're saying, in short, is that we have uh, a willful neglect of, 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 um, of the appropriate uh, public finance uh, regulations. That's my view. Yes. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a serious thing. Yeah. Dr. Castillo, UB, I mean, mm. uh, you're, you're in, in academia. The academia, the premier uh, institution uh, of learning in, in Belize. What can be done from the UB perspective to assist in this, in this process? Well, I think from a national perspective, the aim ought to be we invest in our human potential, we invest in human capacities, and we invest in education. And from that perspective then, we need, I think, to try to educate our population. Um, we're only how much, 312,000, I think, the most recent um, census. That's fairly small. Um, it's only 312,000 of us. Um, so we must, could try to educate ourselves to a far higher standard, um, maybe like, say, um, a country like Barbados comes to mind, <coughs> where the average person is fairly decently educated, and that results an educated population and educated person has other positive social spin-offs. We haven't touched on poverty. Um, the country's poverty rate is over 41 percent, and we used to define poverty as having an income around. I, I think it's the current definition is a family of five having an income of ten dollars per day. Um, so if $10 per day, you multiply that by 365, the number of days per year, you're looking at a family of four with an income level of less than 4000 per annum. That is what Belize regards as poverty. Um, the characteristic of somebody who is poor, who is in poverty, um, it's quite likely that that person isn't educated, um, if we're focusing on that. So the aim is that we need to focus on education. Let's try to educate our population and certainly UB has a role to play in that. We have a faculty of education, we train teachers, um, and that should be expanded. Um, we also have a faculty of management where um, the aim is that you train people not to be employers, but to create their own employment. Um, our students have ideas, to um, small business um, ideas, and you want to unleash their potential, basically, because um, where development is concerned, all that has to play a role. But in terms of in terms of the 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 immediate issue of, of uh, an absence of of proper accountability, um, because I, I think the point that 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 Eddie is raising is is fundamental. Why should I worry about about uh, public expenditure when I'm not being uh, brought to task for any? any discrepancies and any deviation from, from practice. Um, how, can we, how can we rectify that? Well, my take on that is that the rules exist. Um, as Edmund has noted, um, rules exist. The rules exist. Um, there's no need to pass new laws if the existing laws are not being enforced. Um, but that's specifically referring to the public sector. Um, in the private sector, I'm certain that things are quite different. Um, persons are, it's more likely that you're being you will be brought to task in the private sector um, than in the public sector, where, um, as Mr. Zenigan noted, um, 
regulations are not enforced, um, persons engage in over expenditure without being brought to task. Um, so rules, existing rules must be enforced. And I think if that is done, that might make a difference. I, I, I think that programs such as, such as this is a way of educating the public as well, who can or who should then make demands on, 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 on government officials. On, on the elected leaders, yes. Um, to ensure that the accountability happens. Yeah, I think, I think I, that, that's a valid point because I believe there is this uh, notion out there by, and I'd say population in general, to use that, that, that broad term, that we keep on hearing, oh, government, government should pay, government should pay, government should pick up, pick up the tab. But at the end of the day, government gets its resources from the very same uh, uh, population. Right. Right, we absolutely must go to a break, but we'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, gentlemen, we've been having a very interesting discussion on, on one on, uh, from the fact of accountability. It's quite clear that, that uh, we're not doing sufficient to be able to, to have our, our leaders account for, for the use of public resources. We've also discussed the fact that uh, uh, and the example of, of education, that obviously there needs to be more targeted uh, uh, money spent um, in, in growing education. But this notion that we, that we ended on just now of the who pays the bill? Government pays the bill. Government does not in and of itself generate um, uh, revenue unless it's selling, um, service. selling a service or uh, selling um, state, assets. state assets. And quite frankly, when you look at that, what remains as state assets, it's, it's quite, quite, quite little. Yeah. Um, so we don't see that as a, as a long-term growth uh, prospect. So it's true, mainly through taxation. Taxation, your imports of goods, but also to your, your production here. A part of the reason why we can't produce more to export more is that when we, uh, we go to the, to the um, regional market, we're competing with the big boys, the, the American production, Brazilian production, where their cost of production and their economies of scale are much different. They make them more competitive. But then we it's also true that for some of those countries, the agricultural um, sectors are also sub, um, yeah, subsidized. subsidized. I agree. But I'm just saying that and I, to, sh to paint the picture that while we can say, oh, government will spend, uh, government can only spend what it either borrows or what, it, or, or depending on how much it it, it taxes the, the 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 productive sector and, and the, the population in the country. Um, we have the the debt uh, crisis, as we said, uh, looming. Well, it's already on us, um, and we have very slow economic growth. Um, uh, as we said earlier, except for oil, we've not had any new entrant or a new entrant into the into the productive sector or any significant growth in, in, in the existing sectors. How do we change this? How how do we how do we get on a track of uh, on a growth track? Growth path. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously there must be a public-private sector partnership um, aimed at achieving growth in a sustainable way. Um, there is a role for the state in the development process. You want your state to spend on infrastructure. You want your state to spend on primary education. You want your state to spend on primary health care. And then now, having spent on infrastructure, you want now the private sector to take up the slack. Um, the private sector could rightly argue that the cost of capital in Belize is fairly high. Um, interest rates, I think, they seem to be trending down, but they're still in double digits for the most part. Um, so you need other creative ways of raising capital. I would think maybe um, we're focusing on the Chamber of Commerce. Um, your members may want to um, at least start to consider the option of a local stock exchange. Um, it's a cheaper way of raising capital. Um, well, it's a cheaper and most sustainable way of raising capital. But we certainly need the private sector to raise capital to undertake investments because the government can't do it. And the government, in, the government investments, in my opinion, the government expenditures, in my opinion, are to be infrastructure based, and then the private sector focus then on driving the infrastructure based yeah. and, and serving the public, 
public good, health care, basic education. Basic like education, health care, um, where you must include security, um, security and defense and right. kind of things. Um, right. But that is where we, we need a, a reorientation. Would you, do you subscribe to that? That there needs to be a reorientation of, quite frankly, how we do things. Well, indeed. I <laughs> As I as I as I said earlier, it, it starts with it starts with basic planning, setting what it is that you want to accomplish in, in short periods based on what you want to end up with as a long term as a long term goal. Yeah. The the issue of, of the public um, what what is it called again? The public accounts public accounts committee. Committee of the House. Um, I know this is a, a pet um, issue, well, not a pet issue, more than a pet issue of, of Senator Hulse. Um And I think we, we do need to take his lead to a certain extent to make that our pet issue, mm -hmm. for us to understand a little bit better um, that we have officials that have to account for monies being spent or misspent. Mm -hmm. um, and to take ownership of the of the process. Otherwise, uh, the, the prospects are not too good. I mean, if if we can't rein in uh, excessive spending, I don't see what what what's the other. Yeah, I I I, I agree with you that uh, the issue of the public accounts committee is a big issue that has to be taken on. Um, otherwise, uh, there are offices in the country. Which would be, which are useless if the public accounts committee is not functioning. The office of the auditor general, for instance, which spends just under two million dollars per year, um, its reports go to the public accounts committee. And if they're not going to look at the reports, you may as well not have an. When was the last time they met? Do you do you know? I I can't recall. I <laughs> um, actually, in my time, they've never met to consider any of the reports that we've submitted. And you were there for six years? And I was there for six years. I remember when I acted as permanent secretary many years ago that I was called in front of the Public Accounts Committee for some losses of vehicles by the PDF at the time because I was at the Ministry of Defense. But outside of that, I haven't heard of any, any action by the Public Accounts Committee. Hmm. Dr. Castillo, how will how will you play your role in, in changing this? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm in academia. I, um, I focus again on education. You need to educate your population. I think that an educated population has substantial, um, there's a multiplier effect when a population is educated. An educated worker is um, substantially healthier. A healthier worker is more productive. An educated woman uh, makes better family planning choices. Um, so you, you have to focus. Um, the list is small. Again, I stress, I would always stress that there are only 300,000, 312,000 Belizeans. Um, both of you gentlemen have lived abroad. Um, that's less than um, persons in a square in New York, um, like I would think. Right. Um, so yes, there's only 312,000 of us. So we need to focus on educating ourselves. And again, we need government to set the stage. Um, somebody must look at the broad picture, the macro picture. Um, you provide infrastructure, you build schools, and um, then you enforce standards. Standards must be enforced. Um, Mr. Zenega keeps on repeating that rules exist, but these rules aren't enforced. And there's a public accounts committee existing paper which never meets. So these things must change. Um, we must develop a culture of accountability. Because if we are to develop, developed countries need to have accountability. The amount of money that we have is so small and so limited that we must spend it the best way we possibly can. And we could only do that if systems are in place to ensure and demand accountability. And we can't borrow away out of, out of the whole, if even the borrowed money will be, will be mishandled, misappropriated. Well, I think where borrowing is concerned, I think our, um, given, the, given the debt crisis that is upon us, um, you meant um, the super bond. I think we started to pay the principal, I think, in 2019. Um, from what I understand, the Ministry of Finance is saying is that when that becomes due, there'll be a need again to reschedule. 
because the resources won't be there. Um, and even though I think we're paying over a hundred million dollars, I think in, in, in interest, um, and our budget is just around, I think it's 800 million, I think um, it's about an eighth there about um, I don't have the exact uh, figures, but certainly public debt, repayment on public debt has ballooned to become one of government's biggest expenditures. And that needs to change. Um, but to do that, you need to grow the economy. I'm not certain if substantial portions of the debt will be forgiven because it, for the most part, the debt is owed to commercial. Like, right. Uh, uh, this is not a, an IFI that you can yeah. negotiate with. Good. So um, for that level of debt, because we owe so much to commercial sources and that level of debt, it's unlikely to be canceled. Um, our only option, I think, is to grow the economy and then um, having grown the economy and we are earning our way out, then we could then we, we will be in a better position to seek additional, um, maybe, um, well, I would say kicking the ball down the can, but uh, kicking the can down the road. But um, we have to grow the economy. That is the, that is the only sustainable way. And in, and in growing the economy, we come circle again to, to what uh, Mr. Zuniga was saying. In growing the economy, government has to target its resources to, to those sectors that, that that can provide the growth and show um, most promise. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it, it's a it's a it's, circular it's process. A it's a circular process. And through the whole circle, there must be accountability. You can't be wasting the funds because the funds are scarce to start with. Um, but then, it, somebody, um, some institution, um, government, I would think, um, has to set the standard that if rules exist, enforce the rules. And if people see the rules being enforced, um, that might make a difference. And if vice versa is true, if people do not see rules being enforced, mm -hmm. that creates a general lax atmosphere mm -hmm. that leads to more wastage. Mm -hmm. So you, you've pointed out, uh, as in this booklet, volumes and volumes of, of questions and you haven't had oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. answers. <laughs> and, and, and Philip said it right. If, um, if the public and members of the public service see enforcement, they, there is mi the, 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 the issue of uh, lack of accountability is minimized. But we don't see any enforcement of recommendations or anything like that. And so you write to ministries and say, these are the results of our audits, and nobody cares to answer. All right. So we c we'll do the same next year again. Exactly. And or probably worse. Or probably, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> probably worse. Um, <laughs> It's it's really and really uh, um, quite um, quite worrying uh, because we absolutely need, indeed, as as you said, uh, Dr. Castillo last week, uh, the FinSec um, basically said what you said that more than likely come 2019 we have to reschedule um, the, the the current um, super bond, um, but in the interim. To, to, to get there, we've got to ensure that some of the fundamentals are right so that we look like a candidate worthy of of um, um, rescheduling and not being put into the category of a default. Because if we go the road of a, of a default, then the impact on the on the banking sector and so many other sectors in the country would be, would be catastrophic. Um, I found it quite alarming that um, there is this view that we are not doing sufficient. So it becomes even more critical um, where we are at this, at this um, point in time. What's interesting, I must say, is that um, <coughs> the IMF report, um, the IMF gave a report last year, I think, it was fairly positive. But um, if you read the report, what they were saying is that um, government should be trying to pay down the debt faster. Um, government doesn't seem to be in any hurry to do that. In fact, um, if there are resources that have been identified. Um, certainly the Prime Minister has used that not to pay down the debt faster, but to do other things like to um, cancel mortgages and those other things. Um, so yes, the IMF is thinking that the debt should be repaid faster because the debt is a problem, but government doesn't seem to be going in that direction. Well, well quite frankly, you, you were talking about the mindset of, of not um, being accountable, and that is the, the, that is the I believe it, the difficulty with the notion that okay, don't worry. In 2019, we we will we will reschedule, um, in the sense that indeed it, it does not engender a rush to to settle your bills. If you ex 
you're already pronouncing from now that that you will not pay when 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 you should pay. Well, I'm, I wouldn't say the government has said it won't pay. Um, meaning that, let's say certain things are in place. We are paying as we speak now. If by the time 2019 comes, we keep on paying, um, it certainly isn't in the interest of our creditors um, for them to make us default, basically. It may be in the interest to give us an extension so that they get more, um, like more funds. All right. Um, so maybe that's what we are, are, are looking at, that it certainly isn't in the interest of our creditors to force Belize into a default, especially if, as the trend continues, Belize continues to pay. Mm. Continue to pay, uh, the, the issue in 2019 really is the, the, is the bullet payment. Right. Yes, the, um, the issue is that the principal kicks in. Right now we're only paying mm. the interest. The principal kicks in in 2019. Mm. So our payment becomes substantially more then. Mm -hmm. But what could happen, um, what could happen is that if, um, because we've been paying from when the super bond started, if we keep on paying from then to 2019, and our creditors see that we've been paying diligently, they may be more willing to um, listen to talks of rescheduling because right. it means that we pay for a longer time at higher interest. Right, right. But then that, that's really just perpetuating the, the problem. It is. It is. It certainly is. It certainly and, is. and if we're not growing the economy, then we're not solving it. Um, in the long term, we'll, we'll end up deeper in the hole. Than that is so true. That, that yeah. is so true. We must go to our final break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our final segment. Gentlemen, this discussion is very, very interesting, but time has run out. Um, Dr. Castillo, any uh, parting comments? Well, certainly on behalf of the university, I um, was glad to be here. Um, the university takes this opportunity. We welcome the opportunity basically to outreach. Um, UB needs to take a greater role in national development, and we welcome opportunities such as these to outreach. Where the topic is concerned, um, it was if we were living above our income, living above our means, the short answer in my opinion is that yes, but again, if we are borrowing monies and the monies are used are being invested productively, I do not see that necessarily as a bad thing. Mr. Zunigo. Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, I want to thank the chamber for inviting me. I, when the invitation came, I was kind of perplexed. And I said, well, why, why now? Why me? You know, we'll have to go to the experts. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. But I'm, I, I, think, I think the topic, as, as Philip has said, is, is, a, is a relevant topic at this point in time. Um, and to follow from what he's saying, indeed, I do think we're living above our means. But if you account for the money that, that you're spending, you're going to be fine. Um, because you will know when it is that you can't borrow anymore or when you can't spend anymore. Your creditors will, will let you know. That's right. A la, a la Greece, no? Mm -hmm. um, it, this is a topic that, that's very complex, has many facets. I'm very grateful to have you you two gentlemen, and certainly we'd want to continue this, this discussion um, at a later date. It's one of the topics that uh, few people pay um, uh, attention. attention to, but it's the critical issue, simply because, and I, I'll repeat it again, when we say government should do this or should do that, it's your money they're using. I'll end with that and say good night and have a good evening.